All right, let's start our last session so we can hopefully finish on time. I'll mention just a, a couple more books. My, my sincere apologies. Some churches I go to, I sell like three or four books, and churches like yours, literally what I have back there is my entire inventory <laughs> from my house. I'm going to have to go home Monday and order about another $1,000 worth of books to replace all that. But uh, we're going to talk about skeptics and atheists, and there's a, there's a great book. This might be the last copy back there, but literally you get this for the same price on Amazon. Anything by Tim Keller, especially this book, The Reason for God, came out about 10 years ago. And then his latest book, which is called Making Sense of God, An Invitation to Skeptics. I don't agree with everything Keller says in, in uh, Christian theology, but when it comes to apologetics, this guy started a church in Manhattan 30 years ago in his living room with a Bible study. It's now over five or 6,000 people. Most of the people who come to his church um, come as skeptics, just non-religious at all. He really understands the skeptic mind. And essentially, in each of these books, both this one and um, Making Sense of God, he approaches and answers about 15 of the major skeptical arguments against the Bible, against Christianity. So insightful. This guy is the C.S. Lewis of our time. And there's C.S. Lewis's book, Mere Christianity, out there. Much to my shame as an apologist, I never read much of C.S. Lewis until this last summer. <laughs> Old, Olga's having a heart attack because she's a fellow at the C.S. Lewis Institute. And this last summer, I went to Oxford, uh, England, and taught C.S. Lewis to a bunch of college students, English philosophy, English church history. So I read lots of Lewis over the last year and uh, blown away by Mere Christianity, which was written almost 70 years ago. And you read it, and it gets right to the heart of things. Keller does the same thing. So either Mere Christianity or Reason for God or his other book, Making Sense of God, which is only in hardback now, so it would cost something like $25. So I tend not to stock it, but the paperback here is much less expensive. I highly recommend that. This is the kind of book you can give a skeptic and say, would you read this, or could we read it together? And let's discuss some of this stuff. I heard Keller speak 10 years ago at the University of Pennsylvania, Ivy League school, in an auditorium that held 700 people right after this book came out. And they turned away hundreds of people. They wanted to come hear him speak. And most of the people who came to the talk were atheists, skeptics. Keller dismantled skepticism and showed the internal inconsistencies. I thought as I'm walking out, how could anyone still believe uh, in an atheistic worldview after what he said. He's really a master of that. There's another book called What's Your Worldview? If your kids ever read the Choose Your Own Adventure stories where you read and then says, if you think yes, turn to page 73, no, turn to page 29. That's what he does in here, helps you understand worldviews. It's a nice little thin book. Um, and then there's a series. I only have the engaging Hindus, Jewish people, and atheists. There's a, a fourth one, Engaging with Muslims. Nice little small books. If you have a coworker or friend or neighbor that's a Hindu, Muslim, Jew, or atheist, this is just a nice little, um, give you an overview of the religion. Here's how you engage those people with the gospel. So this is uh, by a small uh, book company in England called the Good Book Company, and they have lots of good resources there also. So let's talk about how do we engage atheists and skeptics. Um, it's true that skepticism is on the rise. Uh, sociologists estimate that somewhere around 17% of Americans now identify as nuns, not N-U-N-S, N-O-N-E-S. In other words, they call themselves nuns in the sense of we have no religious affiliation, no belief in God. But here's another thing. They often make it sound like they're on the rise and religion is on the decline. Actually, what's happening is Committed believers in religion and skeptics are both on the rise. What's on the significant decline is casual religious followers. They're significantly declining. People are either choosing skepticism or they're finding in their religion or another religion uh, greater commitment. So we're actually becoming more religious and more skeptical at the same time. What's in decline is this idea that, oh, Christmas, Easter, you know, be a nice person. Because the truth is, if, if, if that's all religion is, why not be an atheist if it's just about being good? I can do away. I don't have to give money. I don't have to go anywhere on Sunday. 
So it makes sense. But also on the, on the incline is commitment to religion. Notice at the top of the handout, there are four major worldviews. Monotheism, belief in one God, which is Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Mormonism. There's pantheism, many of the Eastern religions, Hinduism, Buddhism, Shinto, Taoism, religions like that. And then there are two varieties of atheism, material naturalism and secular humanism. So what is material naturalism? First of all, it argues that all things ultimately can be reduced to material phenomenon or to material process. That blank is the word material. I know for students, whenever I, my PowerPoint doesn't match the notes, they panic. So the, the blank is just material phenomenon or material process. That is, all that exists is physical objects in the world. And they would argue only scientifically verifiable statements can be considered knowledge. That is, only science can give us knowledge. You want to believe in God, don't say you know God. Don't say you know God exists, because that science can't prove that. So they try to section off all belief that's not scientifically proven as myth, fantasy, wishful thinking, um, suppressed, you know, desires. They go the Freudian route. Or they would say, you know, you can believe that like you believe that wearing your lucky, I guess for you guys down here, Washington Redskins baseball cap helps the team win. That's questionable. Uh, someone's not wearing their cap. Or you could be a New England Patriots fan like Kevin and I and we have our own rituals, right? You know, I know, worship Satan because that's what people think New England Patriots fans do. <laughs> One of the consequences of material naturalism is they believe that everything that we love, hate, and desire is biologically motivated so that nothing that we love, hate, or desire has any meaning. So material naturalists will tell you all you are is the sum total of your DNA. So if you love something, it's because you're programmed to love it. Person who loves their child, why do they love it? Because they're genetically connected to it. Not because, and they say love is just our description of our genetic predisposition of things. So if you hate some, something in society, you hate injustice, it's just because you're programmed. There's no such thing as injustice. There's no such thing as love. You don't love anything for any meaning. It's just the way you are. You are a machine, and you do it what a machine does. Some examples of this would be Stephen Hawking, who just passed away, Richard Dawkins. Uh, when I was in Oxford this last summer, I thought, oh, man, I hope I come across him, because he teaches there, but I, I didn't see him. And every day near the Sciences Building in Oxford, uh, there's a, a clock tower, and there's two sides of it. And one side says, it's later than you think it is, and the other side says, but it's not too late. I thought, if I, if I walk past Richard Dawkins, that's exactly what I'm going to say. It's later than you think it is, but it's never too late. Um, but Dawkins, in his book, The God Delusion, uh, one of his latest books, The Greatest Show on Earth, The Blind Watchmaker, Climbing Mount Improbable, he's probably the most well-known of what they call the new atheists, who are not only scientific, and uh, arguing against God, they argue that religion is dangerous. Maybe you've heard of Sam Harris, Letter to a Christian Nation, uh, and The End of Faith. Christopher Hitchens, who is a well-known atheist, died a few years ago of cancer. These people think religion was positively dangerous, and that's a new thing in atheism. Why is it wrong? Why, are these, why is this viewpoint not true? Well, first of all, it cannot prove its own basic principle by its own criteria. In other words, the basic principle of this viewpoint is the only thing that can count as knowledge is what science can discover. So take that principle and tell me where you find that in nature. Do I, do I turn over a rock and, oh, look, it, there's the principle. In other words, this is a religious philosophical commitment that they smuggle in under their science to say that you can only know things scientifically, but they can't prove that scientifically. So it fails as a philosophy. Secondly, it is not true science, this viewpoint, but rather what C.S. Lewis called scientism, which is the belief that science is the sole arbiter of truth in the modern world. C.S. Lewis noticed almost 70 years ago 
that people were misusing science and claiming things for science that science can't support. And if you're a scientist, you know this. And Christian scientists that I know, not, not the cult Christian science, which is a, that's a cult called Christian science, has nothing to do with science or Christianity. But if you're a scientist who's a Christian, then you know that science has all kinds of limitations. It's a wonderful gift from God to know our world, but there's all kinds of limitations in the process. All kinds of biases that come in on the part of the scientist as he does his work. Lewis also noticed that the conflict is not between science and religion, but between science and naturalism. I have no problem with real science. As a Christian, I don't fear anything that science will discover because I know that this is God's world and everything in it speaks of the glory of God. The problem is when people smuggle their interpretations of science by saying, oh, look at this fossil we found. Look at this um, psychological behavior or sociological study. See, that proves evolution. What they've done is they've smuggled in an interpretation. And that's where we as Christians have a problem because that is called science when we know that they're actually sneaking things in. And all you have to do is study the history of science, all the ways in which science has been wrong. I mean, a few of the most awful things are things like you know, when they bled people in the, in the 17 or 1700s to help them, you know, help cure them. And they're, so they're, they're, they're cutting them and bleeding them. If you've seen the, uh, the miniseries John Adams, they're both inoculating this great scientific discovery of the time and then also cutting people and bleeding them. And it's like, this was science. Nazi Germany in the 1930s was the most advanced scientific nation of its time. And look at what happened there. In the 1950s and 60s, the whole idea of the frontal lobotomy was pioneered, where if you were depressed, hyperactive, um, having a hard time with life, they'd insert an ice pick up through your eye into your frontal lobe, and they'd scramble your frontal lobe. It took away all your emotion, all your personality. The Kennedys did it to their own daughter. And that was considered cutting-edge science. Well, now, no one today is going to say that we ought to do that because science is always in a process of changing and refining. So how, if that's the case, can science ever be the ultimate authority if it has to change its pronouncements? Again, we don't, we don't hate science, but it's, it's a gift from God, but it's limited. And that's one of the problems with this viewpoint. Notice letter D, if everything that we think is the result of random brain activity... Think about this. This is what they claim. Everything you think is a result of random brain activity. Why would we think that this theory is anything more than random brain activity? In other words, they want to tell you that everything you think, do, love, hate, it's just random. Then wouldn't this theory be random? And if so, why would we trust it if it's just random, if it's just the roll of the dice? But what they're saying is this theory is truth and everything else you do is just random. That's intellectual hypocrisy. That's saying, again, I've ascended the ladder of the world. I'm looking down on all of you ignorant people who don't know what's going on. You think you love that person. It's just your genes. They're a good mate for you. That's why you're attracted. It's all just animal instinct. But I have arisen above that, and my theory is true, and you can't question that. That's hypocrisy. How do you attain that level? It's just like people that argue that reason determines all things but you used your reason to come to that conclusion, that's what we call vicious circular thinking. My reason tells me that my reason is reliable. Not good argumentation. And so the problem with this viewpoint is it assumes what it ought to be proving. And then finally, natural selection is all about the appropriate behavior for survival. That's what Darwin told us. That's what evolutionists tell us, that we are designed for survival. But somewhere in the last 20 years, they start sneaking in this idea, oh, yes, but we also discover truth that way. Well, is it for survival or truth? Because I can survive without knowing the truth of a lot of things. Uh, and they're, they're trying to sneak in now that we should be empathetic to one another. We should have just societies. Again, we have to recognize, say, wait, wait, wait a second. If natural selection is blind and pitiless, why would we think that that would lead us to truth? Why doesn't it just provide survival? And what they're doing is they're trying to sneak in more than what is justifiable. So there's a couple of books there, none of which I have on the table. <laughs> but um, these are books that address that issue. So that's one kind of atheism is material naturalism more focused on science. 
A second type is what we call secular humanism. What is it? Secular humanism places faith solely in human reason as the bedrock upon which to build a progressive society morally, culturally, intellectually. So they're not against science here. They just don't emphasize it as much. Rather, they say, we humans, we don't need God to make society good. We can progress on our own. Top of page 10, human reason then, they would say, is sufficiently reliable and just to guide our course of lives individually and collectively without any consideration of divine authority. So they're not focused on science. They just say, we don't need God to make a good society. We people can figure it out ourselves. We can build that Ikea furniture without the instruction manual. We don't need anyone telling us what to do. Good luck if you've ever tried to build Ikea furniture. I don't know, maybe some of you are engineers and you do throw it away on principle, but not me. I study it like my devotions. <laughs> Notice, since reason, they would argue, ought to guide our lives, religion must be kept out of the public sphere. I would think all of you living in the greater Washington area, you probably hear this a lot. People think, you want your religion? That's fine. Keep it in your church. Keep it in your home. But don't bring it to work. Don't try to change laws. My skeptic friend um, in Pennsylvania, he spends a lot of his time going to Harrisburg, our state capital, lobbying against Christians having any influence in society. And what's strange is when he gathers atheists together in the county, at the most he gathers 12 to 15 people once a month. And when you come to Lancaster County on a Sunday, there's probably about 150 to 200,000 Christians gathering in churches, a very religious, very Christian area. And yet he's arguing with his merry band of followers that we should have no voice. As Christians, we need to be active in politics and society, not to confuse that with the gospel, but individually we need to let our voice be heard because these secular humanists want to cut all of this out, all this influence out of our society. Notice also, human reason, they would argue, is the instrument and servant of the will. In other words, don't let your religious dogma cloud your thinking. And that's a, if you've read books like 1984, Brave New World, that's a scary picture of a future without God in both those places. Letter E, religion, they would argue, causes evil in the world through oppression intolerance and bigotry. And here's a really important apologetic point. Don't, don't ever defend religion. We're defending the Christian faith. I'm not even defending a generic Christian theism. No, I am only going to defend the truth of the Bible, Jesus Christ. I don't have to give account for um, what the Catholics do, what the Anglicans, what the liberal Baptists or Presbyterians or Methodists do. Uh, I'm not giving account of religion as a whole. I'm not defending any of that. I'm, I'm defending and talking about the Christian faith. Because as soon as you try to defend religion, oh man, you might as well drive your car into 10 feet of mud because you are stuck and you will never get out. But say, listen, I don't know about all those religions. All I can do is tell you, here's what Christianity teaches. Here's what Jesus taught. Uh, secular humanists tend to believe that Let's see, did I go past it? Uh, yeah, there we go. By overthrowing the upper and middle classes, this is essentially Marxism, an ideal society without greed and competition would emerge and cooperation would be natural. So secular humanists are generally Marxists and they would say, let's get rid of any structure in society as far as income inequality because as Marx taught, if we did that, it would eliminate greed and corruption. Uh, did that happen in the 20th century? Not at all. I started going over to Ukraine and Russia in the late 90s after communism fell to teach pastors who had suffered under persecution because they had no biblical training. And uh, that did not eliminate greed at all because I went to the Kremlin. I went to uh, St. Catherine's Winter Palace and the Summer Palace and there... There, the, the Politburo, the ruling class in Russia for many years, lived in absolute decadence and luxury, while the average person barely survived. And in Ukraine, they engineered a, a, uh, a famine which killed something like three or four million people. In other words, secular humanism 
thinks that our problem with greed and corruption is because we have differences in society. Whereas the Bible tells us, it doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor, your problem is greed and corruption. And that's why we need Christ to be center of our world so that we can entrust all things to him. So what are some examples of secular humanism? Christopher Hitchens, who is a well-known uh, British philo uh, not philosopher, uh, columnist, essay writer. If you look up the secular humanist manifestos, I make my students in philosophy class read them so that they understand here is the argument that Marx made. And anywhere it's been tried, it destroys society. Russia, Albania, Romania, um, China, Cambodia. It does not eliminate greed, it just eliminates people, is what it essentially does. So what's wrong with secular humanism? Um, if human reason is the servant or the instrument and servant of the will, it's under no obligation to choose the path of mercy, sympathy, or peace. That is, if there is no God to tell us right from wrong, secular humanists say, well, empathy should guide our thoughts. It's the big word, empathy. But my question is, why? Why empathy? If there's no God, then cruelty and aggression will get you far too. There's all kinds of options. And what, again, they're doing is they're sneaking in Christian virtues in a way that does not, is not consistent with their worldview. The second one, this next one I think is powerful. It's the argument I use against my skeptic friend when he says religion ought to be kept out of politics. I remind him that some of the most sweeping social transformations have begun from the conviction of the truth of Christianity. Think of William Wilberforce in England, who spent his whole life fighting against the slave trade because of the express purpose of his Christian beliefs. Think about Martin Luther King Jr., whose whole basis for the civil rights movement was that this is unjust, this is against God's will. It's just, we just passed the 50-year anniversary of his assassination, and so more attention has been given. But I was in a, in a conference last week in Kentucky where a Southern Presbyterian uh, theologian stood up and he said, you know what? Those Southerners who supported slavery all those years using the Bible um, were violating the second half of the great commandment, love your neighbors yourself. And their use of scripture was a betrayal of their Christianity. He really like, and I'm a Northerner, so I know you're Southerners, kind of Maryland's just a little bit below the line. Um, but he blasted, he said, how different would it have been if Christians from the North and the South had opposed the slave trade based on the teachings of Scripture that we are all made the image of God, that we're to love our neighbor as ourselves. He said, think of the tragedy that would have been avoided. And uh, he got a standing ovation. I think that is so true. And so I argue with my, my skeptic friend. I said, so, so you're saying Martin Luther King Jr. shouldn't have been allowed to impact the civil rights movements with his Christian faith. And he gets really uneasy because he doesn't want to go there. Like he doesn't want to touch the issue of racism. But I said, that was the root of the civil rights movement. It's the root of so many movements around the world. I think the foundation of our opposition to human trafficking today has to be rooted in the unique nature of every person created in the image of God. Our opposition to abortion has to be rooted in that. Our desire for justice in our legal system has to be rooted in that. As Christians, I mean, we have a voice to speak to the social issues because we have every person unique in the, in the image of God. The secular world does not have that. When my son went to public school every month, they had a character trait, courage, you know, dependability, kindness. And at the same time, they're being taught in school, you're the product of a mindless process of evolution. Uh, there's no, nothing unique about you. You're just an animal. <laughs> Two different views, right? We don't, we don't go to the lion in the Serengeti and say, now listen, kindness, all right? <laughs> Learn it, develop it. Why? Because they're an animal. We don't expect, animals don't have morals. And uh, secular humanists contradict themselves at every turn in this way. Notice letter C, Marxism, as you know, resulted in the 20th century, unprecedented poverty, government oppression, dehumanization, genocide, totalitarianism. And when Marxists cry out for redistribution of wealth, they really are asking the government to help the poor, not that they would have to serve the poor themselves. 
And then finally, letter E, humanists can never seem to come to any agreement on anything without the use of power to enforce the opinion of a certain segment of humanists. In other words, as Christians, and so we have to be careful not to get sucked into politics in the wrong way, where we're trying to make laws that, you know, that keep people moral. No, that, that, that shouldn't be our approach to apologetics or to politics at all. Rather, we should, have, we should have laws that protect people to do the right thing. The purpose of government, Paul tells us, is to punish the evil and to protect the good. And uh, as Christians, I don't need laws making my, Christian go to, making my neighbor go to church on Sunday. That's, that shouldn't be my concern. I don't believe that the Bible should be read in, in public schools. <gasps> we liked you up to that point, Mark. Um, I don't think we should have Bible classes being taught by unbelievers in public schools. And one of the problems with, with you know, and, and yes, of course, I think they had a greater influence for morality in, in society. But let's say we make our public school teachers read the Bible. We have no control over their comments after that, right? I'd rather people be able to recognize, okay, public education, and, and as far as options for your kids, I think every kid's different. My kids went to Christian school, public school. We never homeschooled, but we could have. It's different for each child, and there's good reasons for each one. But I think we have to be careful not to enforce biblical, distinctly Christian standards on unbelievers, because they're going to ruin them. Rather, we ought to have simply argue for the freedom of free expression of the Christian faith, so that when people hear the lies of the world, they also know that they can freely come hear the truth of the gospel. So there's some other... Um, resources there. Notice the last two books there, Tim Keller, those are the two books that I mentioned. So very quickly, how do we engage atheists and skeptics? Now we have a professor at Lancaster Bible College who was an atheist in college, became a Christian now, teaches theology. A number of students through the years who are atheists in high school, and they all say, first of all, oh man, I keep doing that. I guess I'll have to tell you these, I must not have slides for them. Don't be intimidated by their hostility. Atheists love to intimidate. And all my former students that were athe- all my students that were former atheists said, oh man, we used to love to intimidate Christians because they were scared if we got in their face and said, you know, Satan, you know, or uh, I don't believe in God, and don't be intimidated. Someone says, Oh, I'm an atheist. We'll say, Oh, that's interesting. Why? What's brought you to that point? And that will open up doors there. Remember that they are most actively suppressing the truth or more actively suppressing the truth of God than any other kind of unbeliever. In other words, religious unbelievers, they're taking the truth of God that they're guilty, and they've transferred that to a new religion. In other words, they're acknowledging, I need to go to church, I need to take the, take the Mass, or take the Eucharist at the Catholic Church, I need to offer a sacrifice or give money. When you get to an atheist, this is a person who's pretending like there's no need for atonement. And so they're, they're most actively suppressing that truth of God, and so I need to take time to ask questions, find out who they are so I can see, because they're doing it in some way. Number three, challenge them with the historical reliability of the Gospels, the historical reliability of the Gospels, and the life of Jesus, not some vague notion of God. In other words, when they question the Bible, I say, well, let me take you to the Bible and show you where historically all these things the New Testament claim about Jesus have been proven time and time again. So so why are you rejecting something that that all historians agree with? That doesn't sound very rational to me. And I often play that card because the unbeliever thinks you're irrational for being a Christian and they're, they're rational for not. I try to flip it on them and say, why are you denying history? Do you not believe that we can't believe anything before us, because that's not very rational. But I also want to bring them to the life of Jesus. I never try to defend some vague notion of God. It it doesn't work. I always get to, well, I don't know about that idea about God. All I can tell you is I worship Jesus. Would you look at the Gospels with me? And then challenge them to present a rational case for unbelief. That is, By asking questions, you're going to show that their arguments for their unbelief, they often don't have very good reasons. They often have not thought through. No one's ever challenged them on their case for unbelief. And uh, by challenging them, you raise new questions in their minds. 
Oh, we're back on track. We have 18 minutes for questions. <laughs>